My name is Peter Carver. I'm a professor of law here at the University of Alberta Faculty of Law. I teach uh, in public law matters, uh, constitutional and administrative law in particular. And I'm delighted to be chairing uh, this opening session uh, of the uh, conference on boldness and Senate reform. Um, I was going to say that this is an audience I feel very comfortable with, an audience that would turn out at 8.30 on a Saturday morning in Edmonton to discuss the Senate is my kind of crowd. Um, so uh, I, we are joined by um, three distinguished speakers uh, for this opening session, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, and from uh, my left, my furthest left, uh, we have uh, Professor Bruce Hicks, uh, visiting fellow and adjunct professor uh, at uh, the Glendon School of Public and International Affairs at York University. Uh, his primary research focus uh, has been uh, formal institutions of governance. Uh, his dissertation examined why some polities are able to reform their institutions of governance and amend their constitutions while other unnamed ones uh, seem impervious uh, to change or more difficult to change. Uh, in the middle um, this morning is um, Simon Potter, uh, a partner with McCarthy Tetro uh, in Montreal. He's practiced litigation in Montreal uh, since uh, the mid-1970s. He's well known and very experienced in the fields of commercial litigation, administrative and constitutional law and litigation, uh, as well as in arbitration and international trade related dispute settlements. He frequently speaks uh, on ma uh, matters of public uh, concern um, and uh, including um, on uh, the duties of the three branches of our government uh, and how they work in a constitutional democracy, a federal democracy. And uh, we're just delighted that he was is able to join us today. Immediately to my left is uh, Kate Glover, doctoral student and Vanier Scholar at McGill University's Faculty of Law and a visiting uh, doctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. Uh, Kate does her research in the areas of constitutional law and reform and legal theory. Uh, prior to her uh, doctoral work, she served as a law clerk to the Honorable Justice Abella at the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, and uh, I think of some interest to us, uh, particular interest to us this morning, uh, she was junior counsel for uh, the amicus uh, curiae, or perhaps perhaps one of them, but we'll find out, as there were two, in the uh, reference, uh, the Senate uh, reform reference that we that we are going to be discussing, particularly discussing in the first session to, uh, this morning, as we try and sort of lay the groundwork uh, for uh, later discussions uh, through the course of the day. So if I can uh, take on that task just for a few brief uh, moments, uh, myself, um, as I have the privilege of uh, being the chair, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do, uh, exploit that. Um, just under 11 months ago, the Supreme Court of Canada, of course, rendered its decision in the Senate reform uh, reference. And in doing so, the court made it, I think, eminently clear that consensus uh, of the uh, federal and provincial governments would be required uh, for any significant uh, reform or change to the institution of the Senate uh, by and through the use of the amending formula in uh, the 1982 Constitution. The same amending formula, I would say, that has largely deterred uh, constitutional change uh, and fright, even frightened many uh, Canadian politicians from discussing constitutional change for about the last uh, 20 years. Now the reference concerned uh, the pr a proposal by uh, the government, federal government of Prime Minister Harper 
uh, that was embodied in Bill C-7, uh, which was proposed, which uh, was a proposal for legislation to be passed by Parliament and only by Parliament uh, to effect two major changes. One, to introduce a non-renewable nine-year term limit for newly appointed senators, and secondly, to introduce what everyone came to call a system of consultative elections uh, that could be held uh, on a province-by-province -province basis um, by agreeable uh, provinces to produce lists of nominees uh, for appointment to the Senate. On that coming forward, uh, the province of Quebec uh, objected uh, and referred the constitutionality of this proposal for unilateral federal uh, legislation to its Court of Appeal. The Government of Canada responded by initiating its own reference to the Supreme Court of Canada. So part of the context of the case was of, in a fashion of dueling uh, references that in, in some sense in, in represented the, uh, the dispute um, at that level. Now, leading up to the argument before the Supreme Court in November of 2013, it was of interest to many of us to see how the other nine provinces would line up on the question of Senate reform. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, most of them joined on the Quebec side, or for the most part, and uh, supported the Quebec position in, in opposition to that of the federal uh, government. Um, now, in doing so, none of the provinces, including Quebec, were arguing about the substance of what Senate is or should be in the future. Their issue was about how the Constitution can and should be amended, and their opposition to it being able to be done in this area uh, through uh, federal, federal unilateralism. Uh, then, uh, on April 25th of last year, the Supreme Court rendered its decision, and uh, somewhat like its predecessors in 1981, they made it clear uh, that the judges don't like federal unilateralism. They decided quite strongly against the federal position in almost every respect. Now, important to their doing so was the uh, an analysis uh, they engaged in and the comments they made about the, their understanding of what the Senate as an institution represents and, and has represented since 1867. Uh, and they did that because in their judgment, uh, they and this was unanimous, they um, uh, concluded that Parliament had the authority to make unilateral changes to the structure of the Senate only with respect to matters that didn't go to the fundamental nature of the Senate and the deal that the provinces uh, had made at Confederation and uh, as they entered the uh, Confederation. Uh, so they defined, the court defined, the fundamental nature of the Senate and uh, they did so and uh, uh, I, now I don't have the quote in front of me exactly but the phrase is essentially that the, sen the fundamental nature of the Senate is to be a complementary body to the House of Commons that engages in sober second thought. And there are two things about that. One, the, the, the idea that the Senate is complementary to the House of Commons was intended and explained by the court to mean that it was, uh, while it had the, largely the same powers as the Commons, it was never intended to be a rival to the House of Commons and to interfere with its legislative uh, endeavors. And the justices said in that regard uh, that um, that's why senators were uh, decided to be appoint appointed and not elected. Uh, and that meant that they would lack the electoral le legitimacy that otherwise would give them the basis to become a rival to the House of Commons. Uh, and so on the sober second thought uh, question, the court said uh, that, well, that requires independence on the part of senators and individual senators so that they can give that second thought freely in their, of their own volition and consciences. Uh, 
And what, but what they meant by independence in particular when they referred to it that way is independence from the electorate, which they quite ex said quite explicitly. So again, not elected. Um, but, but also independent in terms of not having career ambitions that they would look to anybody to grant them favors uh, with regard to. And that supports the idea of lifetime appointments or appointments to the age of 75. On that basis, the court rejected the federal government's proposals on term limits and consultative elections and said that changes of that kind or other significant changes must proceed through the amending formula, which requires at minimum the agreement currently of seven provinces with at least 50% of the population. So I think, uh, if I can to steal another minute, I'll just say that there are two ways, in my sense, that we could say, take the Supreme Court's judgment. Um, we could take it uh, as a, a discouraging note, uh, as discouraging um, change to the Senate, knowing that in order to get to uh, reform of the institution, we are in going to have to uh, go through the arduous, tricky, and risky process of constitutional conferences, discussion, debate, and politics. And there may be no avoiding that. And that may mean that we don't see it in any foreseeable future. The other way to take the, the decision is more positive, and that is as encouragement by the court in the sense that I think clearly part of their message was the Senate is a serious institution. It has and it can perform a serious function in this country or any, in any second chamber that might exist. And that if it's going to be reformed, changed, evolved into something else, it should be done as a result of considered thought and with all the difficulties that are involved. And it, perhaps they were saying it will, require bold, it will require boldness. And that's what we hope that we are here to discuss uh, today. And um, on that note, I will turn the mic over to our first speaker, Bruce Hicks. Good morning. Um, thank you all for getting up at this hour. Even though I'm on, still on Montreal time, I find Alberta time at 8.30 very early to be getting up. Um, I'm going to take you a little, way, a little bit away from the, uh, the legal discussion about the implications of the Supreme Court and, um, and where we go from there in terms of negotiation. I'll leave that to my two legal colleagues um, to pick up on. Um, I'm going to talk, start more generally talking about Senate reform as, a, as an approach that we've had in Canada um, and uh, provide you with some comparative evidence, um, some of which uh, I know David also and Andrew Heard a few of us wrote expert opinions for the Quebec government in their um, in their court of appeal case. So some of the material that I'm going to draw from is, was was in in the paper that I prepared for for the Quebec court of appeal. Um, so there are in Canada some standard conceptions that we have over time come to embrace when it comes to Senate reform. Um, and Eugene Forsey is largely responsible for this. The, you know, the interesting thing about us as academics is those of us who become prolific um, tend to have the capacity to influence thinking. Eugene Forsey certainly fell into that category. And in his writings about Senate reform, he argued quite elo eloquently that any Senate reform approach should be comprehensive and should have three dimensions. It should look at the powers, it should look at the method of selection, and it should look at the number of seats. Um, and because of his, his, uh, his force of argument, that has come to be the way we've looked at Senate reform for, for at least uh, the, you know, the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and his thinking, being very much a, a, a fan of the British parliamentary system, his concern was, of course, that if we change the method of selection by creating elected senators, that somehow we create gridlock like he saw south of the border in the United States. So that's why he identified powers as being one of the three dimensions, because he believed that if you're going to have an elected body, you need to re reduce its powers. 
I don't necessarily buy into that. I think we could have any one of these these approaches, um, and and certainly as far as our constitutional amendment formula, we can tackle one of them without attack, tackling the other. Um, but Pierre Trudeau, for his part, was convinced, um, and so as a result, in our amending formula, we actually identify these three areas as the three areas that um, that the Senate should be changed on or could be changed on, and we put them under the the 750 formula. Um, the uh, um, so, uh, so let's start with the, each of the three. When it comes to powers, what you think the Senate's power should be is entirely conditional on what you think its role should be. If you're worried about gridlock, your, your, your point of, of, of origin is going to be that the Senate powers should probably be only a suspensive veto because you don't want the two chambers competing with each other. If you're worried about uh, there being a check on the executive, um, then, then where you're going to come from is you're going to want co-equal powers like you have in Australia and other places, and you'll focus more on a mechanism for dispute settlement. There's no right answer. It, it comes down to um, what we as a society want to choose for our body, and most countries of the world have through their constitutional negotiations come to terms with what they want in terms of, in terms of, uh, um, of, of their constitutional arrangements arrangements and thus their institutional arrangements. Um, similarly, in terms of method of selection, uh, Andre Blay and I wrote a, a paper on, on the Senate based on, on the predecessor to C7 about the impact of that, of that legislation. And the point that we make there and, and Andre makes frequently in his writing about electoral systems is there's no such thing as a best or better electoral system. Your choice of what system you like, if you're a fan of proportional representation or you're a fan of first past the post, is based on what you think are the priorities for that electoral system because they deliver different different things as you'll see these are this is a table of upper chambers in the world and every single electoral system has been used in one of those chambers so you know obviously there's no right and wrong these different societies have chosen an electoral system that they think delivers the outcome now some of their choices will be based on political uh, calculations where political parties push for the system that most benefits them in other cases it's been the fathers of those countries or, or mothers of those countries when they've written the constitution have come up with what they think is is the philosophical underpinnings for their institutional structure and tried in most cases to complement them um, with, with, the, uh, with the alternate chamber. Um, so your choice of electoral system will depend on these various variables and what you think is the most important and it will vary by each individual. So we as a society, again, coming back to this idea of a social contract, we have to, through negotiation, come to terms with what we want that chamber to be and what the priorities are. And that very much is what deciding which electoral systems is about, is do you want one that delivers strong majority, stable government? That's the argument for first past the post. Do you want a, a, a electoral system that has minority viewpoints represented um, and advanced, in which case you want proportional representation so the smaller parties get onto the legislative agenda, but it's entirely a matter of choice. There is no right and wrong answer, answer in this. Um, the choice at Confederation, after the province of Canada had had a brief experiment with an elected upper chamber, was that the upper chamber should be appointed and not elected. Um, they had a very bad experience with, with uh, an elected upper chamber. In part, it was their own fault. Um, you know, it's, it, it's the McDonald government um, or McDonald Cartier government that experimented with this. They could have gotten good people to run. Um, they didn't. And so the bad taste that was left in their mouth was the quality of person who was going to run in a riding that was five times as big as the, the, the lower chamber was not the ideal person. These weren't people who were going into politics with the hope of becoming cabinet ministers and so on. These were opportunists. Uh, they were people uh, largely with money who were buying ridings. Um, so they advocated for, for an appointed system. Um, from the 1970s to the 1980s, um, most of the provinces, the Canadian Bar Association and other groups, pushed for what, what I call the Bundesrat model based on, based on the German upper chamber. And the idea here was to rebalance the federation. You needed provincial voices at the federal level and the second chamber should, should, should do that. Um, from Trudeau's perspective, he, he was willing to accept a 50-50 where the provinces would appoint half of the senators um, and, and the federal government would appoint the other half 
have. He didn't like the Bundish rat model. I, at the time, used to refer to it as putting a rat in Parliament. Um, that, but the, you know, the idea what, that the provinces were pushing was that they wanted representation at the center where they could control legislation and, and, and be a check on, on the federal government. By the 1980s, we had, the idea of an elected Senate had caught on. All right, and, and it makes sense that that would become a popular notion because we very much have within our, within our discourse this belief that democracy is good and democracy is what gives worth, you know, uh, uh, gives our system legitimacy. Um, it gives uh, the people a voice. It's a check and balance and, and so on. Um, so that had caught on. And of course, the Tripoli Senate that was born here in Alberta with the Canada West Foundation and then and then adopted by the Alberta legislature that meets the, the idea of that was to meet the, the Eugene Forsey idea of three separate separate uh, uh, tenets, which is, you know, you have to look at the powers, and so Triple E was going to reduce the powers of the Senate so the two chambers wouldn't compete. Uh, the second E was that there would be six uh, six senators from each each province, very much looking at the American model, even though, you know, there's lots of arguments why that model shouldn't work and can't work in terms of numbers, which I'll get to in a minute, um, and, uh, um, and of course, elected. Um, and the, and the a system for election that they were pushing was the one used in, in Australia. But like as I said previously, um, there's no right and wrong system. It's entirely up to us. They chose that system because it tends to get independent senators um, who aren't bound to parties. Um, they tend to get elected on their own reputations and, and, and celebrity status and so on. Um, we could, as I say, the way the Constitution is written, we can, we can do any one of the three dimensions. We don't have to do them all at the same time, even though Forsey made some convincing arguments why we should. We could actually move to election on a, with a very simple constitutional amendment simply by re, uh, uh, re changing Section 24 of the 19, uh, 1867 Constitution, which allows for the Governor General to appoint senators. We probably want to change um, 26, 27, which have to do with the, the Super 8 senators that, that Brian Mulroney tapped into in order to get the GST passed that Kim Campbell talked about last night um, and, and seemed to think was a good, good move on the government's part, even though when, when uh, uh, Arthur Meehan tried to do it after Sir John A. Macdonald ceased being Prime Minister, the Queen wouldn't let him. Um, um, because you're supposed to have complete gridlock for that clause to be used, and yet, and yet Queen Elizabeth was willing to let Mulroney use it just for uh, just for the GST. Um, but we could make that change quite simply tomorrow if we wanted to move to elected. But we would be stuck with the number of, of senators that we, we have now, based on the provinces and this idea of that there are four regions regions of Canada. So that comes to the third dimension, which, which is number of seats. Um, I had, um, like other people during the Meech Lake Accord, um, bought into the fact that our country was on the brink and that the, you know life as we knew it would end. Um, so I had uh, I had been in correspondence with Clyde Wells over the Alberta's constitutional proposals because I thought there were some drafting errors in in the bill that he had put before his legislature, and so we'd been corresponding and and uh, I had also um, years earlier being a volunteer or, or worked for John Chiaccia when he was in his failed attempt at the, at the liberal leadership um, in Quebec. And so I contacted both of them and said, hey, if, if I could get the other side to sit down, would you be willing to come to the table and, and talk about Senate reform? This clearly is what's important to Clyde Wells. Um, and maybe Clyde Wells would be willing to budge on distinct society in exchange. Um, so I actually got the agreement over over uh, uh, Deborah Coyne's objections uh, of Clyde and and, uh, and Barassa to sit down and, and talk about it, and I came up with a proposal for how we would break down the number of, of Senate seats. So what my proposal was was that we would give every province six senators, as as Newfoundland was proposing. Um, but I would take Ontario and Quebec and I would subdivide it into three, uh, th three separate districts. Um, and so that way, southwestern Ontario, uh, eastern Ontario, and northern Ontario would each get six senators. So that way you give Ontario and Quebec more senators without giving more power to the Toronto-Montreal corridor. So conceivably on a matter concerning natural resources, a senator from northern Ontario would be voting with Newfoundland and Alberta against the senators from Toronto. Um, so this was the idea of a, of a way to start a dialogue in terms of numbers. My point being is, is, is that 
it is possible for us to talk about numbers, um, and it is even maybe possible to get to get Quebec and, and Newfoundland uh, and Alberta and these places who have quite diametrically opposed views on what the new ch upper chamber should be to sit down and have have a discourse. Um, and other people have different proposals. Uh, uh, Lorna Marsden uh, thought that we shouldn't be using provincial boundaries. Her Senate proposal um, was drawing so that you'd ha you'd have a, a, a riding that would cross northern Manitoba and northern Ontario. Ontario, for example, um, so that way we break down the provincial fr provincial boundaries. So there are lots of different variations we could do in terms of numbers. Um, um, as with all the proposals, whether it was Alberta or Newfoundland, with provincehood would come six senators. So if the if the North uh, became provinces, which which they're rather easy to do based on our constitutional amendment formula, um, we we just aren't ready to do it yet, and nobody will agree to do it. Um, that they would get six senators in return for provincehood. The other idea I, I proposed during the Meech Lake thing is that we should take the uh, various reserves in Canada and make a single Aboriginal province. Um, most of the things that the Royal Commi Commission on Aboriginal peoples um, examined and recommended in terms of powers for the Aboriginal uh, leadership um, are provincial powers. There's powers over health care, over education, and so on. So constituting them as a province, I thought, would, 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 would be a solution. And, and maybe at some stage, um, I'll, I'll spend a little time and, and, and write about that. Uh, other people, like, uh, I think Kent and, and at Queen's University and some others, have, have written about this from an economic perspective and, and so on. Um, so, um, the second thing I want to talk about in terms of the generalities of, of, of Senate reform is how, uh, what, what drives and what restrains uh, constitutional change. Um, as, as Peter mentioned, my doctoral dissertation looked at this. Um, and. Um, what I did was I took um, I took a, a concept that uh, Lipsett and Rokan had put forward um, in their book on party systems. What they had looked at is how uh, political parties had emerged in Europe, um, and they looked at the various social cleavages in the various countries and found that in all cases the way the political parties emerged or the second political party emerged in order to challenge the first, the dominant, or the ruling party was it was motivated by being part of that social cleavage. So once you identify social cleavage, you'll find the minority group that will push for a new political party, and that would drive, drive change. Um, so my, my original thinking was to take that and look at uh, institutional change in Canada to see how the social cleavages were driving or restraining change. The one variation I made is that Rokan, in, in one chapter in, in their book, um, suggests that there actually can be cross cleavages, that there could be more than one cleavage and they work in competition. Um, so what I, what I decided to do was to identify two cleavages, one a partisan cleavage and one a social cleavage, and to see which is driving change and which is, which is re re restraining change. And this isn't unique to, to, to Rokan. Uh, Karl Marx was very concerned about how religion as a cleavage actually interfered with class as a cleavage. So, so other people have, have had this concept that there can be competing cleavages and, and that they work at cross purposes. Um, so, um, so if we accept that in any society that there's one cleavage, and I chose red and blue because that's what we do in Canada. We, we, we have blue for Quebec and we have red for Canada. And we have a very strong dominant social cleavage at the, at the federal level. Um, but we also have cleavages at each of the provincial levels. Um, <coughs> so. Um, and, and so what I found or, or, or what I looked at in, in examining and I went, uh, I started with the uh, uh, New France and worked all the way up to the abolition, abolition of the upper chamber in Quebec in the 1960s. Um, I looked at every institutional change that had happened in Canada and found that in every case that the social cleavage was restraining change. The surprising thing I found is that unlike Lipsett and Rokan, who thought that the minority social cleavage would have their own proposals, that they would be pushing for the creation of a political party or for institutional change, they actually pushed for the status quo, that most minority groups would rather the institutions that exist um, than trying to drive some some form of change um, because they're worried that any proposal that's put forward by the majority group is there to advantage the majority group at their disadvantage. Um, so in most cases, the partisan cleavage tends to go along the sa roughly the same lines as the social cleavage. So you will have a political party, like we have right now in Ottawa, that is largely representative of non-Quebec or of, of the majority side of our federal social cleavage. Um, 
So while these groups will always drive change because they always want an institution that will advantage them, they don't, won't get the support because they're not able to, uh, to, to transcend that, uh, that, uh, that social divide between the two sociological groups. Um, so it's only when a political party emerges, or a partisan party in the pre-political uh, party era, um, because like I say, I went back 400 years, um, it's only when a group that could cross over the two social cleavages emerge that you got institutional change. Um, and, and this was true for, um, for all the provinces. Um, now, the, the actual cleavages in each province changed over time. So for example, in, in, in Nova Scotia, um, the, the, the cleavage was originally Acadian, but then after throwing all the Acadians out of Nova Scotia, uh, they were no longer restraining change, but a new cleavage had emerged um, of, of the Scottish, uh, Scottish Catholics in, in, in Cape Breton, and eventually Cape Breton became a class cleavage, that it was very much labor. And when Nova Scotia was trying to abolish its upper chamber, you very much saw the debate in, the, in both the upper chamber and the lower chamber being one of how, how would Cape Breton be disadvantaged by this? How would the labor movement be disadvantaged by getting rid of, of, of the upper chamber? Um, so we see this in, in, in all of the provinces. Kim Campbell mentioned that they all gotten rid of them, but they all got rid of them at different times because of this, because of this restraint. Um, and this is a breakdown of when each province got rid of them. Um, uh, the Western provinces, with the exception of British Columbia, didn't, well, British Columbia at the time of confederation, or time of joint confederation, gave up its upper chamber. But none of the, the, the Western provinces had them. But in the East, all the provinces had them. And the reason you have, for example, the, uh, the province of Quebec being the last province to get rid of its upper chamber is you had the most pronounced social cleavage there, that the English community very much was resistant to losing, losing the legislative council because they saw that was the place that they had representation that could be a check on, a check on, the, on the lower. So that becomes the challenge for, for institutional change in, in, in our country. Um, so um, prior to the Supreme Court challenge, um, I, I had met with uh, 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 Tim Upal. Um, he went on a cross Canada tour and met with various political scientists and lawyers who'd written about, about the Senate to try and push Bill C-7 or, or its previous incarnation. Um, and I suggested to him, first of all, that his proposal was unconstitutional, but based on my, my research, I also suggested that his problem was going to be Quebec. That the second it seemed that the federal government was serious about advancing its elected Senate, the province of Quebec would undoubtedly make a reference. Um, so what I had actually recommended to him at the time was that um, why not treat Quebec as an, as an exception? Let Quebec, through the National Assembly, appoint its senators and let the other provinces. At the very least, you would probably um, diffuse its constitutional challenge because it's getting something that it's wanted for, for a long period of time. Um, like the Reform Party before that, his reaction was not to want to do anything that would advantage Quebec. Um, so that was a non-starter. Um, and of course, shortly after I met with him, um, uh, Quebec uh, filed its reference and, and challenged, challenged the uh, C7 because they actually believed that the Conservative government, with a majority, was finally going to move on this file um, and, and, and push, it through, push it through the legislature. Um, so that takes us to the Supreme Court decision, and I'll turn things over to, to my esteemed colleague, Simon. Uh, well, Bruce has uh, uh, done very ably, I think, at getting the dialogue going, at setting out what the choices are which are available or which have been considered over time. Um, he makes the point that there is no right or wrong choice, which certainly allows for a very broad uh, dialogue. Um, uh, however, I want to talk about w one aspect of uh, what uh, Bruce has said either drives or constrains uh, these choices, and that is in our legal history, our constitutional history, what our courts have said, what people have already done in trying to uh, change this constitution. And I think that that exercise uh, brings us uh, <coughs> uh, uh, to some light under three headings, which I'm not going to be dealing with. Uh, th these are three tacit headings. Uh, one is what others have thought to have been the right choice. That, that should inform us. Uh, secondly, if we do choose among the Bruce Hicks 
alternatives or other alternatives and pick something that we really want to do, can it be done? Is it possible to do it? What are the limits to what can be done? And thirdly, what we're doing now, is it right or wrong? Are there things that we are not doing now, but which we must do now, that we are not doing, that we are doing which must not be done? Uh, I'm, these are the headings I'm going to be using so that you can come to your own conclusions uh, as to those other three tacit ones. I'm going to look quickly at uh, the Senate itself, some previous attempts to reform it, the modification process, including a, a selection process, uh, and talk about the question of vacancies. Um, uh, it's worth uh, starting out, of course, with uh, Section 17 of the Constitution Act, uh, which speaks very clearly in many sections of Upper House and Senate. The, uh, the words sober second thought go right back to uh, John A. MacDonald. Uh, he saw it as a body of sober second thought and a, a body which would curb the democratic excesses of the House of Commons. I think it's wor worth pausing right there to ask ourselves the question whether either of those two elements are consistent with a heavily whipped Senate. If we have a centrally whipped sell it, Senate, along strict party lines, strict national party lines. Is that consistent with a sober second thought? And is it consistent with curbing the excess you've already seen in the other house? Uh, these, are, these are questions that I think we can answer quite quickly. Uh, just a quick uh, slide on representation. Uh, uh, proportionality some people like to talk about, or equality. I think it's worth remembering <coughs> that uh, in terms of population per senator, Quebec is right at the average. The, the extremes are in the provinces which are not Quebec. And I point that out simply to make sure that we don't have uh, statements about Quebec being overrepresented. Now, the roles of the Senate uh, that, we, uh, that we can distill from the two references which we have had to the Supreme Court on, on, the, on the Senate, uh, we can distill them into three principal roles. First of all, to achieve some kind of a balance of regional interests, uh, to act as a check on the lower house, and to represent otherwise unrepresented groups. There again those three roles, are they consistent with a heavily whipped Senate? Well, I submit they're not. A heavily, centrally, nationally whipped Senate. I don't think that that's consistent with any one of those three roles. <clears throat> Drawing your attention to the uh, third one, the last one, the otherwise underrepresented groups. The Supreme Court said in the 2014 judgment, underrepresented groups Ethnic, gender, religious, linguistic, and aboriginal groups that did not always have a meaningful opportunity to present their views through the popular democratic process. Now, leaving aside that it may be a touch of a stretch for today's Supreme Court to look back and think that proper representation of aboriginal groups or of gender uh, were driving concerns in 1867. I think that's a bit of a stretch. But leaving that aside, uh, perhaps it is that seeing the Senate this way as representation of the otherwise underrepresented is addressing already, today, what Bruce Hicks has called the uh, social uh, cross cleavages. Uh, on the question of protection of, the, of minorities, uh, the the uh, Supreme Court wrote th that this more or less uh, uh, regional, proportional, some kind of representation was intended to assure the regions that their voices would continue to be heard even though they might become minorities eventually. And that clearly uh, is a reference to uh, the, the reassurances which were given to people who thought they might be swallowed up in a growing Canada. I think that is something to be borne in mind and a constraint that we might want to 
keep in our heads as we look at making these choices. Some, some groups require assurance that they're not going to be, disappear. And that assurance was a deal breaker. It was the assurance which made the deal possible to begin with. Um, uh, on this slide, I simply want to draw your attention to the last bullet. Some people say, well, the Senate actually doesn't do much anymore. You know, it doesn't actually stop anything. Well, uh, I understand that the speech, which I'm sorry to have missed last night, of Kim Campbell puts that idea to rest. The Senate has indeed stopped legislation, though one might uh, say it stops legislation much less now than it used to. And why is that? Is that because on its sober second thought it is deciding that everything's all right? Or is it because it is being so, uh, so tightly and neatly whipped? I don't know. Uh, but the fact is, if you have a sober second thought, it might be that you need the sober second thought to put a break and to say just a minute and, say, and send it back for a bit more reflection uh, in the other house. As to appointment of senators, which really uh, uh, occupies a, a lot of the attention of the people who are trying to set out all of our choices, uh, the Constitution says, shall. The Governor General shall, and the Governor General shall. And it is a constitutional convention which uh, 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 says that the Governor General acts according to this shall uh, along the lines of advice received from the Prime Minister of Canada. But it's a shall. That constitution today requires a shall. And I draw attention to section 32. When the vacancy happens, it shall be filled. Uh, now, there are criticisms uh, of the Senate. I just uh, put them out here uh, just to allow myself to say that some of these criticisms, you have to take them with a, a grain of salt. The second one, uh, the Senate is criticized for reflecting the same partisan spirit as in the House of Commons, not, not for being partisan, because uh, partisanry we see in lots of places, but for showing the same partisanry, for mimicking the House of Commons. Well, is that, some, is that an error in the Constitution, I ask? And the lacking of democratic legitimacy, I think that goes to the kinds of choices that Bruce Hicks is talking about. In the, in, the, in the United States, I can't say that that's democratically legitimate to have every state having two senators. Um, on the question of uh, abolition, this has been talked about many, many, many times. Uh, it goes back to the end of the 19th century. Goldwyn Smith was already talking about abolition. Uh, there was a debate in 1906 in the Senate about abolition. We've been talking about it a long time, but, but it is absolutely clear we cannot just abolish the Senate without a wholesale change in the Constitution. Uh, we have had some amendments uh, to the Senate's powers and vetoes. Every time we have added a territory, we've had to add uh, senators, for example. Uh, a, an amendment along these lines, which is of interest here, is the what I'll call the suspensive uh, veto in Section 47.1 of the 1982 Constitution Act, but uh, time doesn't allow us to get into that uh, too much. I right, see. Um, uh, these main attempts included uh, uh, d d suggestions that we should have senators uh, appointed or named or suggested by provinces. And uh, th this came up in the first reference, the 1979 reference uh, to the Supreme Court, and it was concluded you can't do that. You, you, the Constitution requires that the decision be made by the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister uh, simply follow uh, the choices of other, of other people? Um, these minority interests, I, I just draw attention uh, to the point I was making before about this being a deal breaker. This was a, the assurances made which allowed the deal to happen in 1867. Th these were essential conditions. Uh, 
It was for protection. They were essential features, says the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court uh, concluded that, uh, in the, and this is in 1979 as well as in 2014, Parliament cannot, under Section 91.1, impair the role of the Senate. And that, to me, raises not only questions of what it is we can do in making choices among the Bruce Hicks choices, it's also what is it we must do today? Has the role of the Senate, as we've just been defining it, according to the way the world was seen in 1867, has the role of the Senate actually been impaired? Is it being impaired today by things which are being done today? Uh, in the 1979 uh, reference, uh, there was a re reference to election. Election was seen as a radical change, which could not be countenanced under the existing uh, constitution. Uh, we nevertheless do have or have had the Albertan model uh, by which there are elections and by, by which the prime minister has acted as a result of those elections. Can the Prime Minister, a Governor General acting on the advice of the Prime Minister, promise to perform his constitutional duty by looking only at a list prepared by other people? I think this is a, a valid question. Uh, and is there a gray line there? Uh, it may be uh, that under one proposal, the Prime Minister would say, well, I'll look at lots of lists, or I'll give prime consideration to lists uh, being given to me uh, by, uh, by provincial governments or by provincial prime ministers. I will look at them. To what extent is it possible for the prime minister within the current constitution to say, well, I won't go outside those lists? Or I will uh, look at the list, and if I don't like them, I'll send them back and get another list. Uh, it, it is worth debate. My own view is that as long as the prime minister is preserving the power to say no to a list he receives, send it back and get another one and maybe influence the creation of the next list. My own view is it's all right. But the idea that the prime minister can act under the current constitution and promise <coughs> to live with a list or an election which is handled by other people, that's simply not on. Uh, in, uh, just a quick reference to the United States. Maybe we should be less hasty. In the United States, it took them years and years, hundreds of years, a hundred years nearly, to, ref to get their Senate changed, to allow for direct elections to the Senate. Uh, look at that. That's, a, that's the Illinois uh, uh, resolution towards uh, a change in that regard. This is after Abraham Lincoln. So Abraham Lincoln, uh, in the times of Abraham Lincoln, their Senate was not elected. Uh, this is the first such resolution that came out of, oh, sorry. Look at that in the Times prior to word processing. Uh, you know, a resolution today, so since you can, you know, cut and paste and do the, it would be long, long in, because they, they did things with a pen in those days, their resolutions tended to be nice and tight. Um, the modification provisions under uh, under the Constitution I'm not going to deal with because I know that Kate is going to handle that uh, in more detail. Uh, but I do want to take you to the general conclusions of the uh, reference regarding Senate reform in 2014. And the, the, the conclusion generally was that if you're going to change in any fundamental way the way that senators are named or what the Senate can do or the regional representation uh, or certainly with abolition, that requires a wholesale constitutional change. It, it cannot be done simply by tinkering in Parliament or uh, by, you know, practices. On consultative elections, uh, it was uh, said quite clearly, you cannot have con binding consultative elections. Uh, this is the quote, by the way, on that slide, which uh, Peter Carver had in mind. Uh, 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 and it, it is a telling quote. It is a, a, a thoughtful consideration of what actually happens to the essence of a body if you elect them or if you appoint them 
or if you shorten their terms, or if you, uh, you know, ask them as they're being named to promise beforehand that they will retire at a certain age, or if you ask them before they go in to promise in writing to vote a particular way on an issue. Are those constitutional practices? One minute. Yeah. 30 seconds. I see. Point. All right, OK, then. Um, I, these words have been seen important by the person I have the honor of replacing today, uh, uh, Mr. C. these words in the 2014 reference. It's not just a constitutional protection of the uh, 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 of the Senate itself. It's not uh, the, the means of sele the method of selecting. The, the constitutional protection, according to the Supreme Court, goes to the, the entire way in which we get our senators into the Senate and what they can do. Um, and let me just close off. Uh, with uh, uh, something that I think is important in Canada. Do we really have a Senate performing the three roles which the Senate is supposed to do? The, the, the sober second thought, the check on the House of Commons, the representation of regional interests and minority interests, if we actually don't fill vacancies when they come up. That th that non-filling of vacancies, which exists today, is that constitutional? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, so we'll move to Kate, um, who I will be talking uh, more directly about the amending formula and its consequences. I should have said at the outset that we would have a question and answer session and time for that, but we would hold off on that until all our speakers have uh, made their remarks. So, Kate, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, just let me say thank you to the uh, Center for Constitutional Studies and to Pat and all of the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to be talking about constitutional amendment and Senate reform. As Peter mentioned um, at the outset, I was one of the counsel for the amicus curiae in the Senate reform reference before the Supreme Court. Um, and after that case, after being involved so much in thinking about these issues, you know, I went through a bit of withdrawal um, when the case was finished after it was argued. And so I'm always excited to to come and participate in something where people are just as excited about constitutional amendment and Senate reform as I am. And I wasn't um, planning to speak very much about uh, my experience as amicus um, or as junior counsel for the amicus, but certainly I'm, I'm happy to come back to that um, in the question and answer throughout the day if anyone has any interest in the mandate of the amicus or the potential contribution um, or why the court might have appointed the amicus in the, in the first place. So today I'll be speaking about the legal terrain after the reference decision and um, in particular I'll be focusing on the amending formulas, what the court said and uh, what the implications are of the court's interpretation. And of course these amending formulas are set out in Part 5 of the Constitution Act 1982 and I will be talking about Part 5. I will say the words Part 5 too many times, I'm sure. So, more specifically, I'll focus, as I said, on two things. After the reference, what do we know about the amending formulas? How were they interpreted by the court? What do they mean? And what is the analytical framework that the court set out and that we have to apply and think through as we um, try to move forward with uh, constitutional amendment generally and with Senate reform in particular? So I'll spend some time talking about the interpretation. And then second, I'll talk about the um, implications of the court's interpretation of these formulas. What questions remain open? What uh, legal disputes can we expect? Uh, and where should the legal terrain go in the future? Now I should say that I'm not using PowerPoint today and I haven't provided you with the uh, text of the amending formulas themselves. And that might seem strange considering that I plan to talk about some fairly specific uh, constitutional language today and certainly it is the case that our amending formulas are or can seem very complicated and they're not easy to just rattle off word for word but 
And because of that, it might seem easier, right, to think about the interpretation of the amending formulas if we have the text right in front of us. But I decided not to go that route, um, and I did that on purpose. And, and it's because I want to emphasize that the amending formulas themselves are part of a much bigger constitutional picture, right? And the specifics of the amending formulas, the, you know, the, the intricacies of the language, I think become clearer and more intuitive, and it becomes easier to make um, arguments about them and easier to apply the formulas and easier to invoke them for bold purposes, I think, um, if we think about them in terms of the principles and purposes that the amending formulas themselves are intended to uh, bring to life. Now certainly this doesn't mean that we should be ignoring the text of the amending formulas. I would not advocate that. The text will always be primary and in any exercise of constitutional interpretation will always be going back to the text. But as the court said in the reference, the formulas, just like the Constitution generally, need to be interpreted in a broad and purposive way. We need to look to context in order to interpret them. They need to also be um, read in light of the principles that underlie the Constitution as a whole, right? Uh, principles of federalism, democracy, constitutionalism, the rule of law. And they need to be read in light of the structure of government that the Constitution itself is trying to Im implement. And also read in light of the Constitution that could be amended, right? We can't interpret the amending formulas without also looking at the Constitution that could be amended through those formulas. Now, last night in, um, in her keynote address, Kim Campbell said that we know and we always have to keep in mind this relationship between form and substance, right? And this means, I think, that um, constitutional design and institutional design um, of the Senate or any constitutional um, institution is never just a means to an end, right? These, these design features, these formal features are ends in and of itself. These statements of procedure that are captured in the amending formulas make substantive claims on their own. So what am I talking about, really? That these, I'm saying that these procedural rules um, they do more than just set procedure, right? They embody answers and reflect values about Canada's very basic understanding of statecraft and, and what is important uh, to the nation. They present a vision of the Constitution and who should have authority in order to change it, how we allocate power in terms of changing the Constitution. And they establish a way of thinking and reasoning about constitutional evolution as we go forward. And so I've chosen not to have the, the text of the formulas in front of us so that we can keep this big picture view, this relationship between form and substance, um, we can keep that in mind as we uh, think about how or what the amending formulas mean and how we can apply them in the future. So with that, let me start by talking about what the court said about the amending formulas. How did, how did the court interpret the formulas? And so I'll, I'll talk about three things here. First, the principles underlying part five as a whole. Then the principles underlying each individual amending formula, what each amending formula is, is tr supposed to achieve. And then I'll talk about the analytical architecture or the uh, framework that the court set out for how we can go forward to apply the amending formulas in the future. So first, the principles underlying Part 5 as a whole. So in the course of its reasoning, the court uh, stated or alluded to a number of principles that are supposed to be brought to life through Part 5. The starting point, of course, is that the provinces and parliament are equal partners in confederation and equal stakeholders in uh, constitutional design. At the same time, all of the provinces are also equal partners or equal in confederation, right? No one province stands above any of the others um, when it comes to constitutional amendment. They're equal. And so as a result of these relationships of equality, the basic principle of constitutional amendment is that neither order of government can act alone to alter the operation of the federalism principle or to change the fundamental nature of our basic institutions of the Constitution. And of course, that would include the Senate. So they cannot act um, alone, right? Neither order of government can act alone. Rather, any constitutional change that engages provincial interests 
will always require the consent of Parliament and a significant number, a significant degree of, of the provinces. That's the basic operating premise of Part 5. That's what our amending formulas are trying to achieve. And so these, make, these principles make Part 5, the amending formulas captured in Part 5, somewhat aspirational, right? Part 5 was designed to foster dialogue between the different orders of government, between the federal government and the provinces on matters of qualitative um, constitutional change and to protect the constitutional status quo until the parties could come to the table and um, come to some degree of consensus. So Part 5 was essentially designed to bring people to the table. And of course, we all have opinions as to whether or not that was successful, but certainly uh, that is the underlying premise of Part 5. And these are the principles that must inform our reading of Part 5 as a whole as we go forward and must guide us in our application of the amending formulas. So those are the principles that underlie Part 5 as a whole. But then each individual formula within Part 5, because Part 5 sets out a number of different procedural options for how we can go forward with amending the Constitution, um, each of those individual principles also is supposed to give um, or bring to life a particular principle. And so there are four, the Supreme Court said that there are four different categories of procedures within Part 5, and each one has a, a principle. So the first one, the first formula is the general rule, right? And this is the 750 formula, as we've already heard about. And the principle underlying the 750 rule, the general rule, is that as I've said, we need substantial provincial consent in order to implement any change to the Constitution of Canada that engages provincial interests. And this means that, or is intended to um, protect and ensure that the rights and privileges of the provinces under the Constitution of Canada can't be affected without the consent of the provinces. Right? That's the basic operating principle. It seems to make um, good sense. The second uh, formula that exists within Part 5 is the unanimity formula. It's an exception to the general rule, and it provides, of course, that uh, everyone has to agree. Parliament and all of the provinces have to agree to certain listed changes to the Constitution. And here the principle is that every unit of the Canadian Federation must agree on changes that or changes to the most fundamental elements of the Constitution, right? Those topics that are considered the most essential to the survival of Canada as a state. And those um, issues are then listed in Section 41 and unanimity applies. The third category of procedure is the special arrangements procedure and it's talk this um, provision, Section 43, is talking about amendments uh, to provisions of the Constitution that apply to some provinces but not to all of the provinces. And here the, the principle <coughs> that Section 43, the Special Arrangements Procedure is trying to implement is it's to ensure that pr provisions that apply to less than all of the provinces cannot be amended without the consent of the provinces that are affected. So again, it's, it's a, a measure of common sense that the, the um, provinces that are affected by an amendment would have the opportunity to um, participate in the discussion and would have to give their consent in order for it to go forward. The final category of, um, of uh, procedure or the final type of procedure is the unilateral procedure. So Parliament and the provinces are each entitled to um, unilaterally amend the Constitution in certain circumstances. And here, again, the, 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 the principle is somewhat, make, is, uh, somewhat um, along the lines of common sense. Parliament and the provincial legislatures can unilaterally amend aspects of the Constitution that relate to their own order of government, but which do not engage the interests of the other order. So as soon as Parliament is trying to amend something that also affects the, the provinces and in that way engages the federalism principle, uh, Parliament cannot do it alone. There has to be some level of consent from the provinces themselves. And so again, these principles underlie the amending formulas. And so trying not to get bogged down in the specific language of the, of the amending formulas, we can look to these principles to guide us um, as we look forward into how the amending formulas will apply in future cases of reform. So the third part of the court's interpretation that I think is important to look at um, as we move forward and try and think about bold proposals for Senate reform is the analytical architecture of Part 5. And basically here I'm talking about what did the court say as to how we can apply 
part five. What, do, what steps do we need to think through as we're trying to determine which amending formula applies to any particular proposal? And the logic of part five, um, if we read, if you look to the text, the logic of part five really does create this analytical architecture. So in any future case, if we're trying to decide which amending formula applies, we have to ask two questions. The first is, are we talking about an amendment to the Constitution of Canada within the, the meaning of Part 5? Every um, amending formula starts with you know, an amendment to the Constitution of Canada, yada, yada, yada. So we need to make sure that we've triggered that. So the first question will always be, is the proposal an amendment to the Constitution of Canada within the meaning of Part 5? If it's not, then Part 5 doesn't apply, right? And the proposal can be uh, pursued through ordinary legislative and uh, political channels. But if yes, if we are talking about an amendment to the Constitution of Canada in the specific way that it, it, um, it is used in Part 5, then Part 5 is triggered, and then we have to determine which amending formula applies, which is essentially uh, a matching exercise. So this is a fairly straightforward two-step analysis, and the second step, this idea of matching a proposal to an amending formula, is actually, um, I think, going forward after the reference, fairly easy, because Part 5 is organized as, it's a number of exceptions organized at, around a general rule. And part five creates this little algorithm where um, you can plug any proposal, any proposed amendment into part five, churn it through the exceptions. If none of those exceptions apply, then the general rule will apply, right? This general rule is intended to be a catch-all. As soon as part five is triggered, it is intended to uh, capture any possible amendment that you could throw at it because there is this um, catch-all uh, generic general rule. And so this renders part five um, able to uh, deal with any possible amendment. So the second step is pretty easy, but so let me focus instead on the first step of the framework, and this is determining whether or not part five is triggered at all. And this is actually the more difficult question, I think, going forward after the reference. So of course the easy case will be any proposal that actually changes the text of one of our constitutional documents. So if there is a change to the text very explicitly, then we know that part five is triggered and we'll go to the second step, the matching exercise. All of the analytical work will happen at that second stage. A harder case, of course, is when we have a legislative proposal that doesn't actually change the text of any of our um, known constitutional documents, but the proposal might change some other entrenched aspect of the, of the Constitution, um, like the architecture of the Constitution. And in, the, in these cases, all of the analytical work, or a lot of the analytical work, will have to happen at this first stage of the analysis in determining whether or not Part 5 is triggered at all. And we saw this um, in the Senate reform reference because the proposals dealing with the advisory elections, of course, did not change, did not propose to change the text of the Constitution itself. And so one of the arguments was, hey, the text of the Constitution will stay, um, will stay as it is, so we don't have an amendment to the Constitution. And the court said, well, it rejected that argument, saying that there are parts of the Constitution that are unwritten and that can be, if the effect of a proposal is that those unwritten um, parts of the Constitution are changed, these architectural uh, parts of the Constitution are changed, then Part 5 will still be triggered and you will need to move to the second stage of the, um, of the analysis. And I'll come back to this in a moment. So that's the interpretation of the, for of the formulas by the Supreme Court. So let me say now a few things um, about the implications of this interpretation of Part 5 as we, as we move forward. And of course, there are many um, implications of the, court's, uh, of the court's analysis. I could talk about it for, for too long, but let me focus on, um, on three particular implications. Very conscious of my time. Okay, so the first is the continued role of the courts um, in, in the future of constitutional amendment. And my point here is simply that the design and uh, structure of Part 5 all but guarantees the role of guarantees a continued role for the courts in formal constitutional amendment in Canada. So Canada could have chosen to have a uniform um, blanket approach to constitutional amendment, right, that every constitutional amendment is pursued in 
the same way, but we don't have that, right? We have these options, and each of the options require constitutional interpretation in order to determine whether or not it applies. And, because, and the design of Part 5 is such that it's allocating power, and every time it's applied, it, it requires interpretation. And the subject matters that are listed within Part 5 are or reflect the anxieties that have really been uh, plaguing Canada as a nation over time. And so they're very controversial. And as a result, um, there are likely to be disputes. And in our current political and legal climate, the courts um, are called upon to uh, resolve these types of disputes. And this means that the courts will likely have a continued role in uh, informal constitutional amendment going forward, whether or not it's through the reference power or through um, other litigation. The second implication that is worth thinking about are the future legal disputes that can arise in light of uh, the, the court's decision in the reference. And as I, as I mentioned, it seems that the real sticking points, I think, the, the real kind of hotbed of uh, future legal disputes will happen at this first step of the analysis when we're thinking about whether or not Part 5 and the amending formulas are triggered at all. So after the reference, um, one of the uncertainties that comes out of the court's decision is uncertainty about what counts as the Constitution of Canada. And as I've already um, alluded to, the reference uh, talks about, the court talks about this idea of constitutional architecture and that uh, the part, part 5, the formulas, can be triggered if we're changing constitutional architecture. Now, of course, the difficulty with this, or one of the difficulties with this, is that uh, architecture falls within that category of um, unwritten, an unwritten part or an implicit part of the Constitution. And so it can be difficult to know what exactly that architecture is referring to and how architecture really becomes entrenched within the Constitution such that, is, such that it is protected by the Part 5 formulas. Now, I will say that um, despite some commentary to the, uh, to the contrary, constitutional architecture is not a new concept in constitutional jurisprudence in Canada. And when the court's talking about architecture, it's talking about the structure of government that the Constitution seeks to implement, and it's referring to the constitutional framework that's created by the links of the various parts of the Constitution. But coming out of both the Senate Reform Reference and the Supreme Court Act Reference, it's very, um, or it is still unclear as to the full nature of the architecture. It's, we don't exactly know how to determine what parts of the architecture are entrenched and what, and what isn't. Um, and it's difficult to know how these things become entrenched. From after the Supreme Court Act Reference, we see that uh, architecture can be entrenched over time through the, evolu the evolution of the Constitution. Um, and so, undoubtedly, there will be some legal disputes as to what effect this architecture has. But because of it, we need, in, any, in analyzing any future um, proposal for reform, it's always necessary to think about the proposal, how the proposal might affect constitutional architecture going forward. Another type of uncertainty is just about what types of conduct can constitute an amendment that triggers Part 5. And I won't go into this uh, too much, but the questions in the reference deal only with legislative action, right? And those can certainly trigger um, the, the Part 5 formulas. But we'll have to be thinking about whether or not other types of practices or, um, practices or policies or, or decisions can have certainly they can have a transformative effect on the Constitution, and we have to think about whether or not uh, these can count as constitutional amendments in the Part 5 sense. And one of these issues is currently being litigated at the federal court, um, and the issue there is whether or not the Prime Minister's failure to appoint senators um, constitutes an amendment to the Constitution, right? An indirect way of abolishing the Senate by failing to uh, to recommend candidates to the Governor General for, for um, appointment. So my time is up, and so I will conclude just by saying that um, the one final implication that I was going to talk about is that it is important to remember that the court's um, interpretation of Part 5 is as much about what is captured by Part 5 as what is not captured by Part 5, right? Any interpretation of what Part 5 means is also an interpretation of what doesn't fall within Part 5. And so 
the fact that the Prime Minister has said that any hope for Senate reform is dead after, because multilateral agreement is impossible, the positive spin on this is that um, this difficulty of reaching consensus is actually an opportunity, right? It creates the conditions in which we can have a, or we can contemplate a wider range of, um, of constitutional action that can be imagined in order to reform the Senate. And this includes reform that can legitimately f fall without, with, outside of part five and can be pursued without triggering uh, the amending formulas. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, our three speakers for um, very interesting and informed, informative uh, talks, and, but especially from my point of view for being assiduous about uh, keeping within the time limits, the tight time limits that, that they were given.